You are now listening to Out of the Blank. blank, blank. Welcome to another episode of Out of the Blank Podcast. I'm here with Joey Held. Did I say that last name correctly? You did. It's like handheld, upheld, withheld. Well, Those I'm are going to be the names of my three kids. Yeah. I'm, gonna, <laughs> I'm holding you accountable for how this conversation goes. So tell me a little bit about yourself. Absolutely. I grew up in Chicago, Illinois. I, well, suburb of Chicago, Skokie. Shout out to any uh, fans of PETA Inn out there, which is always a go-to when I stop by. <laughs> Great Middle Eastern food. And I uh, went to college at the University of Miami. If you're a football fan, you may recognize Miami as the very first team to lose uh, a game this year during the college football season. They played in the week zero game a couple weeks back, which a uh, great way to start off the year is already with a loss. It's, uh, thumbs it's down. that preseason, preseason. We don't exactly, know. exactly. Except it, it does count, even though it says it's, it doesn't count. I don't know. It's, it's very, look, we very don't, w- we don't look at wins or l- losses. We look at how hard you try. Okay. Exactly. Everyone deserves a trophy in the long run because there are no winners and losers in life. Exactly. And they, and they still have the turnover tra- chain. And anytime I can get a necklace put around my neck for doing something well, I mean, you got to go for it. So I always I like- love seeing that. I always liked Mardi Gras when I came into town and then you try and collect as many beads as possible. Then it turns out that meant you flashed the most. And a lot of people started looking at me like, how are you doing, sweetie? I was <laughs> like, oh, I completely am showing myself in a way I did not mean to do that. <laughs> it's okay. It stays on the streets. It's fine. it's fine. How awkward is that though? I've been hit on by gay people before and I try and be as respectful as possible because I do have gay family members. But at the same time, I'm just like, I'm sorry, I cannot accept your request at this time. If you want to come back maybe later in life when I've discovered a little bit more, maybe I might be into that type of thing. But thank you for your comment and your concern. And I appreciate that. I think that's pretty good. It sounds like a, a nice little standard form response. Then they just look at me and go like, what the fuck did you just say to me? I'm just like, I don't know. I'm just, I'm just trying to create awkward laughter to get us out of this conversation. <laughs> so tell me a little bit about what you do professionally. Yeah, so I work uh, for a company, a marketing communications company that uh, works primarily with B2B tech clients. So anything related to the cloud, uh, supply chain, logistics, all different sorts of uh, things. And we'll help them everything from their their PR and media relations, uh, communications programs, social media, video design, editing, um, lots of different stuff. And I like it because it's a good mix of clients that we work with. So you're not just doing the same thing day in, day out and getting to see a lot of different parts of the world. Um, and because I'm never content with being, uh, you know, not busy, I also do some freelance writing and playing a band on the side. So keeping myself busy. You got your hand in many different cookie jars. I try to. I try to. I do so love cookies. So. When you decided to jump into this marketing thing, now, did you see this as something like it was a way to kind of connect businesses with a form of like advertisement to get their stuff out there? Uh, in a way, yes. Yeah. So there's a, a handful of different uh, parts to, to any kind of communications program. And some people are very much just interested in like a social media type of thing, you know, advertising on social media, reaching their fans organically. Um, some are, are more interested in a full fledged program. So you have that social piece, but you might be writing four or five blogs a month, uh, designing, you know, two or three videos a month, uh, working entirely with the team to help with their overall strategy. Because most brands, and I'm not going to put it all out there, but I think most brands would want to sell their product or service. That's primarily why they're in business. Um, you know, there's other elements to it, but that's a big business goal for them. And so if you go in that just kind of blindly and don't really have a sound strategy of what you're going to do for that, probably won't turn out very well. And so sometimes they'll come to us with an idea of what they want to do and just kind of need help of, of getting it off the ground. Other times it's, it's completely like, Hey, you know, this is what you guys do. So run with it. And I think nobody brings up the fact that we don't see a Coca-Cola commercial anymore because of the fact they're owning the market at this time. 
Yeah, and I mean, you'll you'll still see the classic ones. I feel like I see the polar bear one every Christmas. I never see but, Santa Claus. Oh. No, wait, they took the polar bear one out. They added Santa Claus in because of the fact of what was going on with global warming. They thought mm-hmm. it was a little bit too much tension. It was the same reason why PETA took uh, all like the red, original animal crackers. They, all the animals were behind bars, like in a cage. Mm-hmm. PETA freaking went ham on everybody and was like, no, this is cruelty to animals. And they're like, okay. We're gonna we're gonna grant this, okay? We're gonna take the animals out of the cages on the boxes of the animal crackers, and as long as that keeps you off our ass, and Peter's like, we'll accept it. <laughs> you submitted, not us. You submit. I'm well, like, it's always it's always interesting too, just to see, you know, some of these like those are definitely instances where, you know, I, I guess I could see it from both sides, but it's like going back to another. Uh, beverage Pepsi with the Kendall Jenner ad from last year uh, where it was kind of about you know police brutality and standing up to the police by offering them Pepsi and that's going to solve all the the racial tension and social injustices going on in the world and it was just like how does this get approved how does this get through so many different rounds of approval and, and get out into the world it's always interesting to me nothing satisf- satisfies my feeling for beating up some random civilian than a classic pepsi that <sighs> immediately i want to put the police baton away and stop fighting them invisible ninjas exactly <laughs> See, all right, so when we look at brands and types of advertisements, it's crazy how some people, like, they try and do it on their own when it comes to media production. Do you find, like, there are some clients that are kind of resistant to the change of media? I mean, I think there's definitely some of that in there. Um, as uh, Do you mean more so as far as, like, different ways to reach customers go? Like, more like you're trying to show them like there's this vast amount of like way you can connect with a whole group of audience and people such as using social media, such as using uh, different types of Spotify, whatever types of apps either get whatever information you're trying to get their stuff out there. And they're like, what about the newspaper? What about that? It's like, who, who, who reads a newspaper anymore? Like journalism's turned into now bloggers writing onto web articles and stuff. Not really the fact that nobody really takes the time to enjoy a newspaper anymore. I usually just let it sit in my driveway for like six or seven days until the rain mushes it into the cement. Well, I, I think for the most part, most clients are, are receptive to new ideas. I think in a lot of cases too, it's just a matter of not knowing everything that's out there. Like you mentioned Spotify. I think a lot of people probably don't know that it's not really that expensive to advertise on Spotify. Um, I believe you can do it for as low as, I think it's like $200 a month, which in the grand scheme of a marketing budget, that's pretty insignificant. And you can reach a ton of different people and you know, areas like chat bots where it's still kind of a exploratory area but it's like hey we can have you know we're getting a lot of the same customer service requests or people are maybe having an issue with a a particular product or service or something and they can just reach out to the brand on facebook on well i guess it's primarily on facebook i think is where chatbots are really being most frequently used and just getting an answer you know right away without someone having to constantly monitor it they can spend that time focusing on another part of the business rather than just having to sit and, and field customer responses all day. So people are coming to you for help. So when does that let you have the free creativity that you need to create the type of product for the, uh, the I guess the company or whatever business, whoever's coming to you for the, the service? It's a little bit of both. So we'll work both with companies that come to us and ones that we'll proactively reach out to, you know, whether we know someone that, that works there and, and have that contact already. Um, and there's a fairly extensive vetting process um, just to make sure that we're, we are a good fit for each other and going through that process and, and kind of reviewing, you know, what are their business goals? What kind of program are they looking to run? Uh, and it's definitely a two-way conversation. You know, if they're like, we have no idea, we'll be like, well, here are some options. You know, what, what are you most trying to accomplish with a communications program? And again, sometimes they have a very clear answer of what that should look like of, hey, you know, we need a, a byline in the Wall Street Journal or something like that. Um, typically, that's not uh, a great goal to just have that because um, that's, you know, very much putting all your eggs in one basket. And so if you have a nice variety of uh, both business goals and objectives and then are measuring it in a interesting and uh, informative way. So you're not just blindly saying like, oh, this post got a million impressions and that's great. 
it's like, okay, but like, where were they coming from? Can you dive into that data a little more and, and really go down that route? And I think that can really help inform how your business is going to work moving forward. Yeah, a lot of the concept, like there's a lot of science that goes behind estimating views, likes, shares, all these types of things that go inside what you really need to look at when you're trying to target a specific audience with your business. See, the fact is, if you don't, if you're running a business like a Coke, you know, you're doing these types of things where you're selling a soft drink, you're trying to look at for as many consumers as possible. So you're not really diving into, I mean, you're expanding your reach with advertisements as much as possible, hitting new types of social medias. I mean, I don't know how many times I'm on Instagram now and I'm seeing advertisements for stuff. I'm like, when did that happen? I keep thinking of friends posting a freaking advertisement about like cocaine drug use i'm like well what's going on like this and turns out it's a freaking like install now i'm like wait what there's an app that tells me if i'm pregnant by peeing on it oh that's not that's interesting and i'm Sounds like, like it would ruin your phone hey, that's the point you get a new iphone <laughs> And see, like I see these things and these types of advertisements out there, and it makes me look at which ones would you consider would be dead advertisement. Like for me, it would be the newspaper. It seems like it's still being printed today because some people do like reading the word, I guess, uh, much like reading the Bible. But the whole concept was like, it's all adapting to a newer form. It's, it's turned into the first thing you look at, it's on your phone. You can immediately know what's going on in the news. You don't have to really turn on the TV anymore. Yeah, and I think... Uh, you kind of touched on a nice part there is that uh, they're trying to reach, you know, their consumers, but even a national brand like Coke, it's, there's going to be some people that don't drink sodas that they're not going to really want to go after. And so one of the things that we like to do is create audience personas for these brands. So if you're, you know, let's say you're a, a grocery store or something, you have your general idea of like, the types of people that you're going to attract. You know, if you particularly have healthy food, you're probably not going to get someone that's sitting on their couch all day um, unless they're trying to undergo some sort of weight loss program. And they're like, oh, you'd be a, a good place to start it. But you're probably going to get, you know, the dad that's on the go, the mom that has two kids and she needs to, to grab something on the way to a gym class or something like that. And so building out these actual people. So you give them a name, you give them personalities, you give them the types of spending habits that they might have. And that can really help tailor your messaging for it. So you mentioned how newspaper, not as many people are reading it, but if that's your target audience, it's still people that are reading the newspaper. You know, maybe you have an older demographic that you're primarily reaching out towards. That can be a really effective method. And I could not tell you newspaper ad rates off the top of my head, but I would imagine they're probably not nearly as expensive as they used to be 20 or 30 years ago when people were, were reading the newspaper more frequently. How much is the average ad space on like any platform you can get out uh in terms of cost or size um both i guess i would say let's start with cost like what's the ranges i mean a lot of them will typically range um or typically be decided by the outlet themselves so if you're advertising on let's say like a major corporation website that owns you know 400 different websites and, and brands like that you'll probably pay a little bit more um and i've also found a lot of companies are usually pretty or a lot of media publications are pretty flexible at least on on the types of packages um you can usually get uh you know advertising space on on a website or within a, a magazine um on, a, on online it's usually going to be a little bit cheaper um probably for you know two or three hundred dollars uh to start with um and again there's there's different levels of uh commitment so if you do a, an advertising package um that is you know, a six month commitment somewhere, um, you might pay a, a few thousand dollars, um, maybe 10 or $20,000, depending on the, the reach of the publication. Um, but then going back to what I was talking about earlier, Spotify being another way you can reach people, those Spotify ads, again, start really cheaply. Uh, there's websites like Blip, which do digital billboards. So if you're at a mall, and you see, you know, those billboards that'll change between the different ads, like they have like five or six things that they kind of go through. You can get your stuff out on that for, I think it's like $5 a day. Um, so really, you know, really minuscule uh, payments there. Um, and then as far as the sizing goes, again, it's going to depend on the type of, of ad that you're doing, but most display banners, you're either, either going to have a 728 by 90, which is those wide ones you see at the uh, top of a lot of websites. Um, and then some of the sidebar ones, which are, you know, 300 by 250 pixels or 300 by 300, uh, more square shaped. Um, but I think any uh, publication that kind of has its, its act together with ad specs will 
have a you know an advertising rate sheet or a, a media sheet that they can pass along to you and you can see okay this is exactly what i need this is like what this cost will get me and they're almost always going to offer some sort of tiered packaging so it's like you might have six different options to choose from so I think they're, they're a really lot of work with you. a lot of people consider that advertisements just dying in general and i'm like no you've been it, it's actually higher than ever. Advertisements have been more influenced under our life than anything that has ever been seen in the past. Only on the concept of now we make it an everyday thing and we're just completely ignorant of it now. The fact that like for a minute, I set down my phone to go into a grocery store and I'm like, holy shit, like there's freaking stuff being projected on the walls, like showing like this simulation type thing, like for advertisements, like Coke. And it shows like a, like a floating thing of Coke, like going up. I'm like, what is happening? Like our world has turned into like the Jetsons, but not in the best aspect with the flying cars and the robot that does all your shit for you at your house. It turned into freaking, uh, like everything's getting like, check out this product, check out this product. I'm like, but nobody's aware of it anymore. My buddy's like, you know, I haven't seen it like a good commercial on TV anymore. I'm like, you know why? Because you have TiVo. You have things that skip over that shit. You have Netflix. You don't need an advertisement that way. And I'm um, like, yeah, you don't really see too many advertisements on that or any really like Snapchat or anything. That I'm like, not anymore. Uh, that They found a new outlet. They realized that nobody's looking at advertisements through TV anymore. So they went over to Snapchat. Next thing you know, I'm looking at someone's Snapchat story. Please wait five seconds for this advertisement. I'm like, oh. And then now YouTube does a thing where you're watching a video, they're playing one of two advertisements, not one anymore. And it's not that skip in five second shit. They give you that one on the first one. It's like 10 seconds long. Like, cool. I'll skip that one. And next thing you know, it's the second one. Now you have to watch it for a minute and a half. I'm like, shit, I skipped the wrong one. And it's like, they're literally like, you're going to sit here and listen to this before we give you your content. I'm like, but I don't want to eat the broccoli. I want to, I want to enjoy the steak. I want the steak. And that, that's, you brought up a really good point about the skip there is that's something that brands have to consider too is, I mean, if you have a really engaging five seconds at the beginning, I might stick around. You know, if, if I'm interested after, you know, right at the beginning, you're, you do something or say something that I'm like, okay, I'll, I'll stick around and, and see what this is all about. But a lot of times, yeah, the, I'll see the first five seconds of an ad are just completely wasted. And it's like, no, that's the time you need to hook in your listener. Cause again, like, yeah, you see an ad pop up. I would imagine you are not alone in doing this and immediately just hovering your cursor over the counting timer. As soon as you can click skip ad, you skip it. But if you, so if you waste that time as a, as a brand, then that's not really money well spent. And I think yeah, you, in you right now, we need to think of a way to increase the better advertisement for the SPCA because that shit makes me sad as hell every time I watch it and every time I change the channel. They are not getting views. They are not getting anything. You cannot show me a dying animal. You cannot tell me how it costs $2 to feed him. I, but the weird thing is we'll feed that thing. We'll feed an animal over a child in Africa that's starving. And why the hell does it take $2.50 to feed a dog, but it takes $0.25 cents to feed a starving African child? I, that, that, that logic doesn't make sense. Who's getting what type of food? Is the dog getting a burger, and is the child getting dog food? I'm, I'm confused. But what types of stuff would you say to increase the SPCA's at least traffic to more people donating? For me, take Sarah McLaughlin off the commercial please i don't like how she smiles and she looks like in her eyes it's like you don't know this but behind screen i beat the shit out of these animals and i'm like i know she's doing it. i'll pay you to not have her on there there you go maybe that's the that's the key is if enough donations come on sarah mclaughlin's not on i'm sure she's she's wonderful with animals um but know. she's got that smile you see, the, <laughs> see the crookedness, like the wrinkles come all the way down. It's like a thousand of them. I'm like, that. she's, she's hiding some shit. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's true. But like, listen. No to, comment, no comment. <laughs> listen, listening to the song, though, like, in the arms of an angel. I'm like, are you trying to make me cry right now? Like, it's just, I'm, I'm like a little kid. I'm at a funeral. I don't like this. I feel uncomfortable, out of place. And I want to skip as much as this as I possibly can in my life click it's like it'd be so easy to be like hey did you know kids are, are did you know animals are dying dun, 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 dun. hey you know what we could do we could donate don't be lazy ass that simple i would pay i'd be like here shut up and take my money here's it all 
It's, it's, it's that simple. I think the, the, there's some commercials and advertisements that need to kind of hit you in a way like, hey, hurricane, you know, disaster, like this type of stuff. They need to kind of be impactful. Like, hey, the seriousness is this pretty dramatic stuff. But you can't have Sarah McLaughlin talking about dying dogs. You can't do that and expect people to want to sit there and watch that thing. Nobody wants to sit there and make themselves sad. Their life's sad enough. Well, I think that that touches on a, a good point of advertising in general even if you're not you know even if you've never donated that's an ad that resonates with you right because it's something that's tugging at that emotion and for me personally i think the most impactful commercials are something either that makes me laugh or that makes me kind of sad honestly like and i'm thinking about like oh man that is bad maybe i could do something to help with it and i think that's a a common i you know goal that advertisers should have is you should be trying to get some sort of emotion out of people if you just have your ad you know i I, the ones I always kind of think of are these um, local lawyer lads, local, local, well, that's hard to say, local lawyer ads where say it's just, times fast. Uh, I will not, I'll, I'll knock the <laughs> computer over, it'll be rough, where it's just very much, you know, they're, it's like they're so obviously reading off a cue card and it's just like, have you been injured in a car accident? Give me a call. And it's, it's like, there's no emotion and I, yeah, I couldn't tell you any of those names or numbers or anything like that just because it, the message is so like it just sounds so generic and like kind of recycled from any other ad. You could really interchange those. There's not a ton of personality to them. And then the ones that are kind of, you know, a little more over the top or maybe have some sort of different way to get through all of that noise out there. It's, those are the ones that, that you'll remember. I had one ad that really stuck in my head. Uh, one of my favorite ads, it was a Doritos one with the goat. I saw that while I was eating ramen like sitting behind my buddy and he's sitting there just kind of watching the TV and I'm sitting there and I go and lift up and I just put the ramen in my mouth and I hear ah! like that. And I spit it all out. Like, <laughs> I will remember that exact moment for the rest of my life. And I, I, I won't ever buy a bag of Doritos, but the concept of that was a funny ass commercial. So that's what people go for sometimes when they watch the Super Bowl. It's either the halftime show or it's those ad or those commercials. I have a buddy that hates football, but he'll watch the commercials. I'm like, I mean, yeah. Why do they save them for such an impactful event? Why don't we get more of that good stuff? I mean, it can be hard to come up with a 30 second spot that's worth watching. So maybe you can only get one good one a year from a brand. But it, as far as the Super Bowl goes, with how expensive they're going to, I mean, the average cost of a 30 second ad last year, I think was $5 million. And it's like brands, I think are, are kind of leaning in ways of advertising both before and after the game. So again, you can't, I don't know if, if this is a, a common thing, but working with all different kinds of, you know, companies that want to advertise around the Super Bowl, I, you can't actually say Super Bowl unless you're one of those sponsoring companies. So you'll find creative ways to work around it. I know Stephen Colbert likes to say superb owl when he's describing it. And uh, Newcastle ran a really clever ad campaign, I thought, where they had uh, Anna Kendrick and then Keyshawn Johnson in a couple of different uh, ads where they were basically talking about the Super Bowl, but every time they said Super Bowl, they'd bleep it out. And it was just like them getting ready to film this epic Super Bowl commercial that Newcastle was going to put on. But then they couldn't actually film it because they weren't allowed to say Super Bowl. So it's like talking about how crazy this commercial would have been and how Anna Kendrick is like the perfect commercial babe hot as opposed to like supermodel hot. She's like, I'm commercial babe hot. It's, you know, it's, it's fine. It's great. And so just having those sorts of workarounds, Newcastle didn't have to spend $5 million on an ad. They were able to, whatever it took to hire Anna Kendrick and Keyshawn Johnson, which is certainly less than $5 million. And they still got that same kind of exposure that they, they would have gotten had they spent all that money in, on the Super Bowl. And so I think you'll see brands, we've already seen it starting, but I think you'll see a lot more of it getting more creative around ways to advertise around the Super Bowl without having to actually buy a commercial during the Super Bowl. I think it's crazy how there's certain types of things that like companies that now have like, they're basically turned into Ric Flair. Like whenever you go, Woo! You think Ric Flair immediately in your head pops in that image. Whenever I say ba da ba ba ba, you immediately think McDonald's. Whenever I say, I'm giving them free fucking ads, please. <laughs> uh, whenever, like, I, you know, you say ba dum, you immediately think what? Are you serious? You don't know? Ba dum, that whole thing. It happens after every single show or whatever you turn on this thing. Oh, like the, like the Dolby? 
the Netflix. Sound. Oh, I'm usually on. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, okay, okay. Netflix, but um, I was gonna, I was gonna say, there's a few that kind of do like a but um. <laughs> well, like I'm thinking the, of like the the, the Dolby like surround sound. Yeah, the IMAX yeah. at the beginning. <laughs> You're like, oh shit, the, the whole damn house is shaking. We're experiencing a freaking. I'm ready. Yeah, my body so, is ready. <laughs> yeah, it, but I was talking about like Netflix, and then now Amazon. Did you hear what's happening with them now? They're now doing uh this type of video where now they're hiring. They just hired Jim Gaffigan to do his comedy special for Amazon Video. Oh. And now Netflix is like, uh uh-uh, uh, uh uh, no 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 no, this is our fucking territory. You took out Barnes and Noble. Okay, we gave you that one, but you're not taking out us. We took out Blockbuster. We'll end you. We'll put you in a hole. And I'm like, oh my goodness. Like you see the tensions rising in between companies. You really see the market and that turning into this like monstrous thing on Wall Street or something. Everyone's kind of out for their own penny. And then my favorite commercials, like you hear a good old like truck commercial, that guy that comes on, it's usually Sam Elliott. Everybody knows Sam <laughs> Elliott. He comes on and goes, want to buy a Ford? And it's like, oh shit, I'm sunk in. Let's go. Here's my- That's a good Sam Elliott. I like that. (laughs) You know what's funny is I always talk about Sam Elliott because I find him so goddamn awesome. And my cousin is actually from, uh, he's from, I think he's, I don't know if it's California or Colorado, but he was like, yeah, you know, Sam Elliott used to babysit me, right? I was like, what? Excuse me, what? Because he comes from, my cousin comes from money. He married uh, this uh, what well, was going to marry this girl, his fiance, who was like multi million, like eight thousand dollars on a dinner was nothing. They had private jets and shit, and he ended up splitting off because he didn't like that. He she didn't. He just didn't like her personality. Conflicts rise, whatever. And um, he was like, "Yeah, I used to live next to that guy. He used to babysit me all the time." I'm like, "What?" He goes, "Yeah, I used to eat dinner at his house and stuff." And he starts walking away. I go, "Uh, uh-uh, uh, 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 <laughs> come back here. No, 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 we're talking about this. I've said it before in my podcast, and he even uh, uh, is open to it. Like, yeah, he's just a person, man." He's just another person. I'm like, no, he's the guy that did the damn truck commercials, and he's the stranger from the Big Lebowski. What are you talking about? That dude is not average. He's above average. That man does not age. He was in freaking Roadhouse. Are you kidding me? Oh, he's yeah, he's been like 75 for at least 50 years. He's always been an old man. Yeah. When I see him in the ranch, like when I saw that, like what the fuck's a Netflix? They probably paid for that advertisement, but shit, I was already like, I'm watching <laughs> it right now. <laughs> You know, it's, I like that because, like, now you see Netflix, they're creating shows, they're creating original stuff, and it's becoming more content. They're trying to get into the media market where, you know, now you see Disney, they're running the show, dude. Disney's buying Marvel, Disney's buying out everything, and they're like, we're going to own all this shit, so then you have to watch one of our films. There's not going to be another outlet. Like, I remember the good old, you know, you get the get some side show, whatever, side documentary, self produced self-directed whatever the hell you ever seen that one movie is made by two comedians it was called billion dollar movie i did not i heard i heard about it but they literally a guy paid them a billion dollars to make this movie and they made it they literally blew through the money just hiring a lot of famous people and made it was the stupidest movie ever and at the ending they have the guy that invested all his money into it and he goes i spent a billion dollars on this shit like it's literally like epic movie, those type of scary mm. movie type movies, like the parody type things. But it was so damn funny. I was like, I want, I want original stuff like that, not stuff just getting reproduced. Disney's looking for a quick buck. I mean, I love them to death. I guess. I mean, they're cool. You know, Goofy, Mickey, all whatever the hell, all my cartoon influences. But the sad, sad fact is, they just keep rewashing old shit. I'm like, people's attention spans. I get you're trying to connect with an, a newer audience by making it newer for people but you're losing the faith of a, all the old followers like when someone watches like the old star wars and grew up on that and they go and watch the new ones they're like it's cool but it's only really cool because now i can connect with my kid over star wars but it's like i didn't i haven't seen any of the new ones i don't want to see any new ones i watched the first 30 minutes it's like what the fuck is this where's liam neeson where's these types of people i watched in star wars and like I, when I was introduced to that, like I still think Star Wars all the way, Star Trek, you can just, you're crazy. Um, <laughs> but it was like th- those, now everything's becoming so like everything about the money nowadays. It's like, what happened to the good old advertisements you used to see? Like, you know, like you were talking about lawyers. Those are like probably the worst advertisements. Have you been painfully injured? Have you been attacked? Well, call me. I'll come to your aid and I'll be there for you. And I won't charge you a dime unless we win. And I'm like, okay um i'm trying to stay away from as much criminal activity as possible but if i start selling meth on the street i make sure i come to you 
<laughs> and then like it's like you're already sitting on their face on a park bench anyway that's how they get recognized anyway like i mean they're walking down the street some guys like hey sat on your face and you're like everybody took that out of context you took that out of context I'm, my face is on a park bench you know and it's like you see those uh lawyers that walk down the street and they're like seeing a hobo sleep on their bench like you're covering up my face <laughs> it's like the real estate agent like you, you you literally got the money for advertising but you didn't want to pay for the actual advertising you're like i'm just gonna put my name on this bench exactly exactly it's it's free publicity even if you're blocked 80 percent of the time <laughs> Well, if I guess it's not free. You're paying to put it on the show. <laughs> if you had one advertisement way that if you were making a company and you'd want to promote, how would you do it? Hmm. That's a good question. I think it, again, it would depend on what type of audience I'm trying to reach. Um, I do think that I, Spotify is a, a really interesting way and, and to a lesser extent, Pandora and just any kind of music streaming site, I think are good ways to reach a solid amount of people without having to spend a ton of money. Um, and just kind of going back to digital advertising in general, it's just the amount of information you can get from that. I think it's so helpful in figuring out what you want to do next, because you might think like, oh, this is the type of message that will resonate with my audience. And I'm a big believer in A-B testing. So basically putting out the same message, but tweaking one little part of it. Um, and that way you can get, you can see like, oh, is this one performing a lot better than the other one? Then this one, you know, this B is the second, second one. And it's the better one because more people are interacting with the content. They're clicking through to our website. Um, but I think, yeah, like platforms like Spotify and Pandora, just if you don't pay for the premium version of it, you make that trade off by listening to ads. And if you're not going to, you can't skip it, you know, like you're going to have to listen to the ad. And so it's, you've got a captive audience there. You're not paying a ton of money to do it. And if you can get someone that is interesting sounding and says something that's worth checking out and has a memorable way of getting you to take that next step, because some people might just listen to an ad, tune it out, whatever, it's fine. But some people might be interested and then it's like, okay, where can I go to learn more? And if you don't provide that, if you don't give them that call to action, then they'll just kind of be like, oh, well, whatever, I guess I won't go check it out. But if you can say like, hey, this is going to you know, save you $10 every time you go shopping or something like that, then they might be like, okay, I'll, I'll check it out. And then you say, visit this website, you know, visit this, this Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, whatever. And giving people that actual next step, you're more likely to get them, at least some of them to, to go over and I Get, remember the learn more about you. I remember the first time, uh, like advertisements figured out they could go to the web, the internet when it was kind of just coming out. Like you know, computers were now becoming a thing. Everyone had one. And you clicked one thing, and next you get like fifty different advertisements to the point where it slowed your computer down. Even though oh, you're yeah. probably just looking up a bunch of porn, but like now you see that that's the only thing that really i at least i get advertisements for besides just the stuff i see on my phone. But like I'll be looking, I'll be like, I'm trying to watch this movie i wouldn't say is illegal or being filmed in a theater at all at any types of source anybody listening out there that might be dealing with law enforcement this is not incriminating evidence my name is john waters no it's more like um like i'm sitting there watching it next thing you know bam a browser pops up for something else i'm like what the hell is happening and you're exit out of that one i remember back in the day there used to be fifty thousand things that would pop on the screen if you literally diverge from this small little window that you had on your desktop you were hitting into dark territories where you click one thing bam 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 to the point where you're like playing like a shooter game you're trying to click all the freaking x's as fast as possible bam 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 and i'm like Holy shit, what happened to that? That used to be, they used to force feed that stuff down our throats. Nowadays, it's just like, it's there. Now you're just ignoring it. We don't know how to get your attention anymore by literally shutting off your phone and making you experience this thing called life. But it's the same thing you said, A and B plan. It's adaption. There, it's a, it, like humans adapt. So are advertisements. Things have to survive in a new market. The market changes constantly. It's constantly fluctuating. You're up, you're down, you're sideways, you're freaking in a corkscrew, you're in outer space. It's going so many different paths. It's hard to really narrow down and stick to the same thing over and over again. And coming from someone that enjoys a small town business, like sitting in a small town coffee shop, like uh, stuff like in my town, I saw it immediately. It, we gave ourselves the title, voted best small town in america berlin maryland i i i, I sit there and i look at it like the f i fucking grew up here 
I know what it used to be like and I see what it is now. And they redid everything, all the walls, all the old buildings. It's nothing but old brick style buildings. Beautiful. Not anymore. They redid it, made it fresh, looks too new. I was like, where's the character? Where's the where's the graffiti spot? Where's that shit? Like there are some graffiti art that is beautiful. It is an art form, depending on how you take it. Then you get the guy that draws a dick on the side of a building. You don't want that there. But it was stuff like I remember walking down the street seeing the old video store. Now it's something completely different. It's a freaking some new age type uh, freaking electronic section store type thing. I was like, what the hell do we need that for? That used to be an old town video used to rent movies and i get that era kind of die but i remember sitting on the corner with my buddy eating freak we weren't stripping but we were eating hot fries and we were just like we just got freaking alien versus predator we're about to go back to the house watch that we weren't old enough to do it but we knew the lady that ran the store she knew our parents so she's like i fucking your parents cuss all the time i know for a fact you're gonna be fine watching this movie we're like yes you know airheads all that stuff those were moments like all night we'd be sitting there like oh shit you know you hear that clicking noise from predator you get freaked out dude. you're you're looking everywhere around the house even though you're home alone and uh it's gone dude i i miss that because i see kids growing up nowadays and it's like i, I mean i'm in no way an old man i'm in no way older i still have a hell of a lot to experience i think i'm never gonna stop learning until the day i die and it's i just see kids of younger generations just now being completely fine with being comfortable i'm like i've been there it's not fun it's it's the world's changing and you got to grasp hold of it you don't want to get nostalgia from looking at an advertisement you want to get nostalgia from having moments with your families and it makes it very hard for people to disconnect from this type of you know technology and connection thing that is beneficial but it's it's turning into a detriment the way we're running with it yeah, I don't know if I have a ton to add to that. I think that was, that was pretty well said. Yeah, you you remember the the actual moments of it. I could not really tell you any kind of like binge watching moment where I specifically remember. I was like, oh yeah, that time I watched six episodes of this show with a friend. It's like no, I remember like going to the movies and eating an entire bag of sour skittles, and my tongue was. Oh, yeah. Out of commission for several days, <laughs> and I would not recommend yeah. that. Yeah, you were like, "Hey, I I made this roast. It was uh, cooking in the smoker for six days, man. It tastes like biscuit barbecue." And you're like, <laughs> "Oh, that sounds amazing. You go to eat it. You're like, I can't taste it. You don't have you don't have taste buds, dude. Sour Skittles, man. I remember I did that with forty two warheads. The sour. Oh no. Warheads. I was like, I could do it because sour stuff. It just doesn't hit me hard. Also, that show Hot Ones. You ever try that show? <laughs> My buddy ordered the last dab. Dude, I was dumping that shit on everything. I was like, this isn't hot. My buddy takes a spoonful. Dude, I don't know how you do it. I don't know how you do it. And I'm like, and I, I podcasted with this woman that I work with. Um, she's from Central Guyana. And her dad makes uh, the, the California Reapers or Carolina Reapers and grows them himself in the hot Indian sun and then turns it into a curry paste and ships it over here. It's like a really hot, hot sauce. And she goes, your white ass isn't going to be able to handle this. I said, <laughs> I said, let me get this. And I literally took a spoonful and I'm like, actually really good. She's like, you're not mouth sound on fire. I'm like, nah. And I just started eating spoonfuls of it until the whole jar was gone. She's like, you must have Indian in your blood. And let me tell you something. I have had the last dab. I have dumped that on every, everything when it comes to my salad and the only part that hurt when I was in the bathroom. That's when it was literally straight drop and fire. I was <laughs> pain. But those types, of, the, those types of things, like those types of experiences you get, you're not going to really get anymore. Like the best part about like, you know, eating a bag of sour Skittles or doing whatever like that and ruining your taste buds. And then, but you were, you were still having moments with friends nowadays. You know what I mean? Like you would sit there, crack open a two liter, you know, order Domino's pizza or whatever. And you'd be sitting there enjoying moments with your friends. Nowadays, everyone's confined to a screen. I'm like, whoa like how many times do you go out to a restaurant how many times uh i don't know seven or eight i guess in a month what now how, when you go out how many people are on their cell phones the whole time during the dinner i mean a lot a lot of them That's it's sad it's also especially like I, I feel like we use cell phones in general just kind of as a a way to like pass the time while we're waiting or 
you know, like you're waiting for your food to come, you're on your cell phone or you're waiting, I'm on at Starbucks or something, you're on your cell phone. And it's, I've tried to not use that as the crutch of like, oh, it'll be like a five minute wait. It's like, oh, we're all on an elevator. Like, let me just pull my phone out real quick. It's like, no, let me just observe the world that's going on. And sometimes you'll, you'll see something great that's happened. You know, maybe you'll see someone like knock over a glass container and it shatters and like they didn't realize it. And you can be like, hey, someone should clean that up because... I don't want to step in glass and I don't think anyone else does either. Um, But just like the things that you can see when you get your head, and this is going to sound really old man soapboxing, but you put down your darn phone and observe the world around you. It's real nice. I mean, I've been with friends and I tell them, I'm like, if you're around me, don't have your phone on and be looking at it constantly. Like I, I do everybody a service. At least when I do my podcast, I try my best to keep my phone off and away from me. I usually have it charging across the room over there. And it's just the concept of um, I want to remain connected and, and actually engage in a conversation. Like if I see someone pull up their phone and be kind of disconnected in a way, I'm like, dude, you're not giving me full attention as much as I'm giving you. Like I used to do this in person and face to face before I discovered the online type stuff because, uh, you know, everything ends up adapting to online and uh, like doing it face to face. I tell people like, give me your phone. Like what? What? It sounds like I'm asking them to give me their firstborn child. I'm like, <laughs> give me your phone for just a little bit of hours time. I'm like, okay, next thing you know, we've podcasted for three hours and I'm like, all right, we're done. Here's your phone. And they look and they're like, Whoa, dude, it's been three hours. I'm like, yeah. I'm like that's what happens when you <laughs> engage in a conversation. You lose that when you start looking at your phone. The fact that me and my buddy went out to the movies and now there's a thing instead of silencing your cell phones, you know what they say now? Please Dynamo. dim them, yeah. dim them. What the fuck? If I see that phone screen light up in the theater, I'm going to flip shit. I, I'm, I'm a very passive and understanding guy, but it's like, come on, man. I remember that used to pop up back when we had the flip phone. Like you turn on the flip phone. Like, does anybody remember that struggle? You had to hit the button three times to get the one letter you needed to send a text. Oh, yeah. I love that because I have people that send me paragraphs just complaining about shit. And I'm like, I wish we had flip phones or something where you could, it would take you forever. I would understand that you, you literally meant the seriousness of it if you were able to type all that shit out. You yeah, had- it'd be interesting to see how many people give up on, on like from back in the day, gave up on a message because they, it just took too long to type. I literally can't text and I'm sitting there like texting and next thing I know, some dude's like sending me like sentence responses in text. Like, bam, all here is bloop, bloop, bloop. Bloop. I'm like, I'm fucking blowing up over here. And I look over <laughs> and it's like, one, it's like literally one sentence text. I'm like, you couldn't send that all at once. And he's like, sorry, I meant to add them all together. But I kept thinking and thinking and adding more and more and more. I'm like, if we had the phone text and someone was pissed off at you, they would just send the frown face, not the emoji, <laughs> the actual frown face, the two, like the, the semicolon thing, that shit. They would send that and just be like, I'm upset with you. And then, or they'd call you and then you just wouldn't pick up. And then you just let that storm blow over. But nowadays you're sitting there typing back a response. Like you just, I don't know if you know Lavelle Crawford. He has mm-hmm. a bit, um, he's a stand up comic, but he had a bit about uh, his girlfriend and him got into an argument and she's faster at typing and his fingers are too fast to type <laughs> back. And she goes like, you're a fat piece of shit. You're never going to be shit. You're and he's like sending all his texts and he goes, okay, okay. And he goes and hit the buttons. And as he's like halfway sending through his text, like this is it. And she's like, bam, with another one, bam. What are you too fat to text back fast enough? Bam, bam, bam. And just, he's, like, he's like, shit. Like he can't even like <laughs> the point, like he brings up the good point. Dude, when you were on a flip phone conversation or a landline conversation, hanging up on a motherfucker, like someone was giving you crap and you were just like, I don't have time for this. Like, like slap. he has the best bit for that because that was real stuff. You try flipping your iPhone now. How are you going to shut it off? You just tap end and then you don't even know if you hung up on the person. You put it in your pocket. I'm still here. It's like, oh, shit. Like you're sitting there talking trash on the person trying to slap your leg to turn the phone off. And next thing you know, it's like this is where I see like I love technology, but I see it, it's too much. The fact that my cousin used Uber to get home with his bike when it, he got caught in the rain. I'm like whoa that's a new one i haven't heard of that one yet yeah he was like yeah man i got caught i just got caught in the rain i I had to uber home thank god he could fit my bike in the car i was like you didn't ride in the rain no man why would i ride in the rain i'm like can i I talk (laughs) to your mom real quick and she's like he's like yeah why not and then sat him down i was like look 
you're not raising your kid properly. <laughs> he didn't ride in the rain. She's like, what happened? I'm like, he Ubered home. He goes, yeah, um, it was raining out. And I was like, what? You normalize this too? He's like, oh man, my kid's going to know what it means to the essentialness of what it's like to lights out at a certain time. 10 o'clock's bedtime. No more watching Netflix until you go to sleep. Sorry, son. <laughs> we got to go back in time a little bit. But I mean, it's kind of with a long tangent on technology there, it's how do you stay focused on like other things like you like that's got to I mean, it probably dominates most of your world, at least when it comes to marketing and worried about like advertisements and that type of stuff when it comes to business. But how do you kind of dive off into your personal like you said you were in a band and I know do you do stuff you do podcasting too, correct? I do. Yeah. So and tell me, tell me a little th- bit about those, man. I think, um, like you kind of hit it on the head of just being present in the moment. So, uh, our band burning years, uh, playing throughout Texas and, and other States. Sometimes we'll probably have a, a tour of some sort in 2020, but I uh, still in the, in the workings for that. But yeah, during, during practice, try not to look at my phone at all. You know, we'll, take a break the place where we practice at sometimes can get really hot when you have five guys crammed into you know a tight little space and we're all that's what they're out playing texas exactly exactly burning years yeah name for oh it's burning Burning years yeah oh i'll say i'm sorry i thought you said burning (laughs) texas i was like that sounds straight up like an std (laughs) no but like burning years so what types of music do you focus on uh so we play uh it kind of started out as pop punk and it's i I feel like evolved a little more uh, just into general rock. So the name is from a story of the year song. If you're familiar with that band uh, from the mid two thousands or so, they're still making music, but that was their heyday. Um, but just any kind of, you know, new rock that you enjoy. I feel like you'd probably also enjoy us. Um, well, both my family members are, uh, they're all DJs, radio broadcasters, and they've like got music. I'm, I, love all types sadly I've, I've been influenced by it all from being raised on kiss or going over to johnny cash to diving over to meek mill to whoever you know my I've, I've experienced the whole world of music so like do you focus like you said you kind of more of a rock type vibe now what type of rock would you kind of similarly relate it to i mean story of the year is a good comparison i would say just because they you know that's who we took our name from uh, and we i i want to say brand new it was kind of a an influence but i don't know their lead singer is kind of a a creep and not a great person so <laughs> i don't like saying that one as much anymore um i mean a lot of us like i uh, you know like blink 182 newfound glory but i i think we're a little like less fast paced i guess than that um but we can we can get some speed going uh, but some of the newer songs are a little more i uh, moderate tempo so you create 100, 112 beats per minute yeah <laughs> So you create your own, right? Yeah, we, we write our own songs. Um, we will do covers from time to time. We had a really nice cover. My, I'm going to put my singer on blast here because he doesn't like when we do this. But we had a really nice cover of Pony by Genuine uh, where we put a little more of a, a rock flair to a, an R&B song. Um, and, and people would always compliment it. They'd be like, hey, that cover of Pony was great. There was one show I remember in particular. There was like a group of people who were kind of like, they were enjoying themselves and then pony came on and you just saw the look in their eyes of like oh my gosh i love this song and it like takes them a second to get in because it doesn't sound like it right away and then the the vocals start and they're kind of like wait a minute i know these words and then they're like yelling along at the chorus i'm like coming right up next to the stage and, and wanting to sing along it's awesome isn't it how it's crazy if a band like takes a song and they turn it into their own version of it it's crazy sometimes it's better than the original Oh yeah. And I think that's what makes for a good cover is you have to create your own spin on it. You can't, you know, there's so many covers out there that are like, it just like, they're mimicking it. Yeah. Not to call Weezer out their recent cover album. If you've listened to that, a lot of those just sound like it's Weezer doing karaoke. I'm like, that's fine. Like they're all, well, I don't like all of the songs they picked, but most of the songs are like, you know, good songs on their own. There's, I still it's just like a hollowed out version. My yeah, angst, my teenage angst years where I was listening to Beverly Hills. You know. What I mean? Oh, for sure. I mean, Weezer. Weezer has plenty of of good songs out there, but this whole cover album just kind of felt like a little bit of a cash grab, which it probably was. I mean, at this point, I don't think they really need to keep making music. I'm sure they're all doing quite well. But yeah, yeah. Well, was, I think 
like a really good song that impacted me that was like a ch- like a cover song was this guy that did the song by Andre 3000 hey ya um it, you actually get to listen to the lyrics i think a lot of people misunderstand what andre's saying in his song when they listen to hey ya they just hear the catchy beat all right all right all right like that whole thing mm-hmm. but it's like uh my baby don't mess around me because she knows me so it's all about this guy and his love for this girl that he's losing and it's like really fucking like heartbreak like you're listening to this dude do this cover version of it and he's just singing it like acoustic dude it's so revolutionary like it's something like oh shit this is better than andre 3000's song like it literally like it packs impact into your soul and i'm like damn like i just got humbled through a song and it's like that was just someone on youtube and like we talk about you know a lot of artists like i don't know if you might feel this way too but a lot of people get their start on youtube you know, a lot of people, and that turns like there's some comedians, like one of my favorites, Bo Burnham. He got his start on YouTube, and that's why comedians don't like him. They also don't like the fact that he uses music in his act. I'm like, but people are different. They adapt to their own niche and their own topics and stuff. Like, if you have two bands that are exactly the same, it's going to be like, we just choose one. We don't need to listen to both. You know what I mean? That's what makes like Burning Years, it, like the way types of music you guys focus on. Like, it, it that's a, that's a that's a that's a group decision on whatever types of songs you try and create do you find the, more of a fascination in the writing process or do you find more of a fascination in just being able to sit and just play music together uh i th- i mean my favorite part is always the live shows i uh, it still blows my mind and we're by no means like you know on a national stage or anything like that but just to while we're playing to look out and see people singing along to songs that we've created and just like everyone you kind of touched on this how music like it's it's essentially a way that can bring people together like you'll look to your left and it's like you know a 50 year old woman and then to your right and it's like a 12 year old kid and they're all enjoying the same show that you're enjoying and it's just so cool to see how people can come together from all different backgrounds and it's like the just like the universal equalizer Uh, and it's so cool to see that at our shows too. I'm like, these people might literally have nothing in common except that they're all fans of our music. And it's amazing to see that, you know, they might do like a little like swing kind of thing or like running around. There's always at least one circle pit during our shows, which, you know, more power to them, but I, I, I never want to get involved in in this. Yeah. Beating the shit out of other people. Yeah. Well, the best, I think the best thing a band can receive in the satisfaction of an audience loving them besides singing their songs is when you get the lighter that comes out and it just starts waving it above the crowd. And now to, to go back to our, you know, technology is the root of all evil. I, now you'll see just people pull up. There's like lighter apps on the phone and they're just waving them. Like you selfish son of a bitch <laughs> downloaded the Zappo app just for that or Zippo, whatever. I, was I like, guess it's yeah. slightly less of a fire risk, but still. <laughs> yeah, like there's a guy, like you're in an 80s alternatives, whatever band, like a remake or whatever. Someone comes, let's say Journey comes back on stage. Okay, you're lighting a lighter. You got to be careful because there's a shit ton of hairspray in that area. You know, you're it's dangerous. dangerous. Almost, it's like Wayne's World when the lights are trying to yeah. light her going through lights <laughs> from tear on fire. They like, go, oh, shit. That's another one with good product placement in movies. Wayne's World, there's a scene oh, yeah. where he goes, Sorry, we don't sell out to advertisements. Then he pulls up a Pizza Hut box and lifts it up, and you see the front logo for Pizza Hut, and he pulls out a pizza, smiles, and eats it. He goes, Yeah, we don't need any uh, types of funding for products on our uh, uh, movie, man. We could do this all on our own. He's wearing like, a full suit that's covered in Pepsi logos. And then he's like, Man, I'm telling you, all this talk about advertisements giving me a headache. And Garth comes out. Well, why don't you try one of these? It'll relieve your symptoms. And it just like, I'm like, this is fucking great. This isn't even like they're forcing anything at it. They're doing it in a comedic way. And sometimes that's the way they get it, the whole point across, man. Oh, it's brilliant. I, I used that scene in a paper in college that was on like good types of, I think it was just like good types of marketing or something. And I was like, it's so like over the top satire that it, it's like, I don't even know if those brands paid for that or not, or if that's just them just doing a bit with, with all those, you know, with Reebok and Pepsi. And I think it's Excedrin that he takes for the, for the head. So yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And it's just like, it's like such, it's so well done. I love it. I had one uh, for my communications uh, as like public speaking class. We had to do like different types of advertisements. You had to give like different types of speech and one was an advertisement speech. And they were like, you have to make a product and sell it. 
And I actually thought of mine on the idea that I was in a grocery store and my little cousin rammed the shopping cart up the whole back of my heel. And immediately I got thrown into a complete nostalgia of me doing that to my mom when I was a child. <laughs> and I realized that the anger I saw in her face when she turned around looking like she's about to have one less child on the earth. And I was like, oh, I get it now. So I decided to create a bumper for the front of shopping carts that would be installed like a little foam bumper. And it would stop the kid when he hit your heel. It wouldn't hurt. You'd be like, hey, pay attention. And the kid's like, okay. And then you turn around and start walking. The kid fucking rams you again. You're like, dude, I should pay attention. Next thing you know, the kid's walking out like you're literally dragging him out of the store like Ray Rice after that elevator incident. And, uh, <laughs> But like, you know, I, I sold this product and I was literally like, have you ever had a little bastard hit you in the back of the leg with a shopping cart? And everyone's like, yeah. And I was like, cool, buy this product. It'll stop that. And I just walked off stage, dropped Mike freaking out. <laughs> Best yeah, I, I expect to see this on Shark Tank next year. <laughs> I, Mark, dude, I so. Mark Cuban, let's go. Dude, he's got, he's got that, he's got that like, I don't give a shit money. Have you seen his, that video where he cussed and they find him a uh, $1 million or something like oh, that? Oh yeah. Or no, it's $50,000. And he's like, wait, I got to find what? And he goes, for saying that? And like, yeah, what do you have to say about that? And he goes, fuck it. Make it 10. Like, he's like, <laughs> I'm like, I wish I had that. Because that dude is like, he does not care in the world about the problems of money that people face. You see co people that constantly save it, constantly try and produce it. You know, the same cause like Bill Gates, like that dude's just an innovative guy. He doesn't ever want to stop making money, even though he could stop and still be fit for the rest of his life but he's like no he goes i don't enjoy it for the money aspect i enjoy that this helps me fuel my passion for getting more content and getting more understanding of people out there i'm like that's freaking goals man you know you don't want to be that dude that lives the jordan belfort lifestyle just to burn out quick you want to be able to be satisfied and make sure that you did it in the correct terms you know what i mean exactly and and bill gates in particular does so much charitable work too and it's like that's got to be a great motivator as well so it's like hey this stuff that i'm doing is ultimately going to be helping people like all throughout the world and i mean at least for me that being able to make a ton of money to help do that would i mean that's motivating so what now with your podcast what do you focus on in your podcasts uh well i have a couple different ones i locally sourced joey is one that i started five or six years ago and then kind of took a little hiatus from it that primarily just focuses on people that are doing something cool with their lives. It's usually uh, authors, musicians. Uh, like interview. Kind of, yeah, yeah. Very, very uh, interview style format uh, of that one. Uh, and then I also am a host of Parks and Rec, which uh, if you're a fan of the show of Parks and Recreation, uh, we watch it. We discuss oh, don't. with a guy who is in uh, the Parks and Rec department who has never seen the show. He works here in Austin in the Parks and Rec department but has not seen the show. So we're getting him educated. We're getting him caught up. And then to make it a little more interesting, we're getting Parks and Rec while we're doing it. I saw um, Parks and Rec after watching Guardians of the Galaxy and I, cause I like Chris Pratt and I was like, what's the show he was in? And I was like, Oh my God, like, this guy's hilariously funny. I, he the is, parts is the blooper. Fantastic. The oh yeah. Parts is the bloopers. He's nope. he, yeah. The scenes where it's just like, I mean, it's clearly just like, Hey, improv something and we'll just take the funniest one. And it's just like 15 in a row of him just going off on lines and it, it cracks me up every time and a fun little Easter egg. We just, so we're each episode of parks and rec is an episode of parks and recreation. Uh, and so we just watched one not too long ago where I, uh, Chris Pratt's character, Andy has a bucket list. And one of the things is to become an action movie star. And he was in guardians of the galaxy and Jurassic world. So mission accomplished. Well done. Johnny karate. Isn't that his name? Or the whole, what's the song? Chop, 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 chop. That, whatever that, <laughs> like that show was hilarious. And that's when you see someone with true ability and talent in the form that they're meant to be in. You know what I mean? Like Johnny Depp, like, you know, the fact that he keeps buying homes for some reason, I don't know why he owns like 46 of them and they're all <laughs> like billions of dollars and he's not living in any of them and he's not renting out any of them. He just owns homes. So we'll probably be seeing Pirates of the Caribbean like 80 yeah, he's gonna be in a lot more movies. Like they, they, they tell him too. They're like, "Can you stop buying homes? You don't need to live in them. Actually, we should probably sell some of these because you're, you're, you're not really gonna be able to sustain all these." He's like, "No, 
just gonna buy another one. I'm just gonna buy another one. I'm just gonna sit there on the market. I'm like, okay. <laughs> it's, just, it's, it's like, but you see people like that. Like Christian Bale, I think, has the best aspect of what it means to be an actor only on the concept of that his weight transformations that he did. Have you seen him in The Machinist? I have not, but I saw him in uh, The Fighter, I believe, where he, he had to like drop like 70 or 80 pounds for that. Dude, he's went, The Machinist was Holocaust survivor to the point he literally, I want you to look this up on your phone, dude. The Machinist, like his weight transformation, his hip bones were ripping out of his skin. Oh. Like you could see his ribs ripping through the skin. His stomach was sunk in like a Coke can. His face was all shallowed in. Like he literally looked like he hadn't eaten in days. And he talked about like he would, they, they almost had to resuscitate him and stuff because he lost so much weight. And then after that, not even in like eight months time, he packed on so much weight for Batman, gained like, like 80 something pounds for Batman. Like he played Batman Begins like, whoa. Literally <laughs> they said, whoa, like you got too big. And they're like, what do you mean? He goes, you're like a bear. This isn't what we wanted with Batman. We didn't want Batman this big. We wanted him lean. And he's like, oh, so when you see in Batman Begins of him doing push-ups when he gets out of bed and doing these types of things, that was way they could incorporate on set to helping him lose weight and drop it and get lean. And then he eventually slimmed out to like 189 kilograms, like doing that whole thing, uh, playing the normal Batman we see today. But his weight transformations, when he played Dick Cheney, he was 240-something. And then dropping back down to 190 and then doing these types of things, he went out of his way to literally wreck his fucking body just to play the role. Yeah, it's it's impressive commitment. That's when I give commitment to someone that's like an artist that literally hears the, like the the amount of time it actually takes to write a song and doesn't just use like, let's use that default beat and I'm just going to mumble into this mic and then we're going to produce it and it's going to get millions of dollars. I'm like, I Mm. get it. It's lazy, but I get it. Do you want money? It's all about that. But I'm like, it really impacts somebody when it shows that an artist can truly create a work or create a cover and then also have fun with it on stage because there's no better feeling for an audience member to feel connected to a person on stage performing or even a performer to see their audience connect to them in such a way. Exactly. So, man, I, at least I appreciate you doing the podcast, dude. I know we didn't have like a whole lot of like specific stuff to talk about, but it was cool shooting the shit, man. It was definitely fun. Yeah, I enjoyed it. Now I, I need to go watch that Doritos Goat commercial again because that's a great one. <laughs> <laughs> like that, that had me dying, dude. I'll never forget eating ramen. Whenever I freaking heat it up, man, I'm like, oh, I think of that commercial. <laughs> Well, hey, man, thanks so much for being on the podcast. I want to give you here a minute at the end to be able to plug your stuff so people can be able to find you. Absolutely. Appreciate it. Uh, you can hit me up on Twitter at Joseph Currency. Uh, and then wherever you listen to podcasts, Parks and Rect, the N is just the letter N and then Rect spelled W-R-E-C-K-E-D. And uh, yeah, ParksRectPod.com. There's, we're all over Twitter and Facebook too. So Give us a follow and uh, let me know your favorite Parks and Rec character or quote or moment or anything like that. Because there are so many of them and they are all wonderful. And that was Joey held and we held him accountable for a lot of things. And now you're going to hold him accountable for how you see Parks and Recreation. Well, thank (laughs) you so much, Joey, for being on the podcast. It was awesome having you, man. Thanks, Robert. Appreciate it, man.